Good morning, an intrepid, um, uh, uh, climate-resistant, uh, brave Washingtonians. Um, if this were, of course, Boston or Anchorage, uh, no one would have noticed. But in Washington, it's more or less shut the city down. And anyone who's on Metro knows it was empty this morning, which is kind of nice. But, but so you all are obviously particularly motivated. Um, uh, so we've seen one force of nature out there. Um, you will experience another force of nature in a minute. Our, our new colleague, uh, Katina Michael, who's just joined us at ASU from uh, the University of Wollongong. Um, just a, a, most of you I've seen before, but not everyone. So just some quick contextualization. This is part of an ongoing series of um, seminars focused at uh, bringing in people from Arizona State University, who we work with our colleagues, 
to talk about really concrete ways of thinking about um, uh, challenges in science, technology, and society, and policy, uh, and intervening uh, to uh, improve our governance capacities, our capacities to manage the um, ingenuity that we constantly unleash on the world through our scientific and technological capabilities, often without a lot of thought uh, beforehand about what, what then happens. Um, and uh, Katina will certainly is, uh, throw herself into the middle of a particular maelstrom that we've uh, created for ourselves around um, uh, ubiquitous uh, surveillance, the disappearance of privacy, the, uh, um, uh, the enormity of information, and so on. But um, the way we run these things, as most of you know, is a short talk, uh, hopefully to both provoke and give you some uh, very concrete ideas about things uh, that you can do moving forward in the science technology policy realm. <coughs> then um, a conversation among all of us uh, and uh, Katina for another half hour or so. We'll wrap up uh, probably shortly after 10 since we're getting started a little late. But invite everyone to continue to stay, continue the conversation. You have a workshop here, though, that's starting immediately afterwards, though. <coughs> and I don't know whether whether most of you are planning to stay for that in any case. but So let me just turn it over to uh, Katina and um, let her uh, take it from there. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Daniel. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming despite the snow. Today we're going to talk about location-based technologies, emerging technologies that are potentially not location-based but more visual-based, how the law in America uh, treats location technologies, how we go through warrant processes uh, to collect data about individuals, sometimes how the law works and doesn't work uh, to protect citizen rights, the process of getting a warrant and the emerging confrontations we have today going from handset-based technologies that collect data as you traverse the world versus technologies that are static. For instance, facial recognition technologies, which are now new forms of location-based devices. So during the last decade or so, location tracking and monitoring applications have proliferated. We didn't have them previously. They were specialist devices, uh, particularly with the emergence of geographic information systems, the linkage of sensors on individuals, on things, and on buildings. Uh, we were able to track and monitor. It, unsophisticated devices used to exist in the 60s and 70s, uh, devices so named as beacons um, that could roughly identify someone in a particular location driving a particular vehicle. They were not on the individual but on things the individual drove uh, or interacted with. And of course this was an era of telecommunications interception and access as well. But you couldn't enter a home. You had to wiretap from an external point you couldn't trespass the home. There are even cases dating back to the 60s and 70s uh, where law enforcement officers were using every means they could not to put their hand across into the internal area of a, of a home because that would be considered trespassing. So they would think about things like, is a garage part of a house? Is a driveway part of a house? Although telecommunications interception at the hub uh, could be done and therefore wiretapping occur. We're now living in a completely different era where Internet of Things devices are being invited into our homes. So we've gone through 30 to 40 years of saying no trespass, no further. You can't collect data from inside the home. This is a private location. This is a, a private conversation. And we distinguish very nicely between the public space and the private space, and that kind of space is, is uh, blurring at the moment. So the question is, we've spent so many years, so many decades trying to perfect interception, trying to perfect 
uh, the rights of citizens, not trespassing as law enforcement agents, going through the right process to get a warrant, executing that warrant in the right way. And now all of a sudden, we're inviting surveillance into our homes. So common devices like Alexa are now in our homes. There's no need to actually even put a wiretap there. We've got surveillance devices listening to everything we say, whether it's through our Samsung TV, which can actually view in and listen in, if you've read the 70 pages of terms and conditions, if it is an internet-enabled um, Samsung TV, for instance, through to Alexa devices that can hear your conversations from the moment you wake up and just before you talk about that particular command, like play this kind of song or this song. And these things are now available in transcripts. And we've seen this retrospective use of data through very basic technologies like Fitbit devices, like Opal cards, like transit cards in Australia, to show which direction you're traveling in. Is it north, south, east, or west? And this is all evidence towards particular uh, confirmation that someone was involved or possibly involved in a case. The two words that are very important here are probable cause. And law enforcement agents have been able to be awarded a warrant if there has been a probable cause, and we can put those into particular crime groups, you know, such as narcotics trafficking and other things, murder, uh, suspected abuse and other things, of which uh, there needs to be some probable cause for you to collect data. Another interesting point is to look at the difference between covert and overt tracking. Covert tracking is when you are unaware that someone is trailing your location. Overt tracking is when you're completely aware. In fact, someone has a sign saying, you know, we are currently monitoring you as you go through a shopping mall. And location-based technologies can be handset-based. For example, a GPS sensor embedded in your smartphone. Or they can be measures like signal strength or triangulation or assisted GPS, which uses more than one capability to determine your location. So either you are wearing the device or carrying it like this, or, and the sensor is inside the device, or the triangulation happens through the network, so network-based or handset-based. Interestingly, companies who offer these location technologies have to have the ability to understand how you are using your smartphone. So for service dimensioning, teletraffic monitoring, uh, the ability to ensure that there is no congestion in the network, service providers and operators, uh, ICT giants, internet search companies, uh, argue that they must be able to monitor what you are doing, your behavior, um, and must be able to collect data from you in order to be able to serve you better, service provisioning. And often uh, that is the excuse um, provided and it's a valid excuse. A service provider can't bill you if they don't know how you're using your smartphone or uh, using the services and applications on that phone. However, the level of invasiveness is uh, continually encroaching privacy rights of individuals across the world. In fact, uh, at a conference only the other day at the International Symposium on Technology and Society, someone argued uh, if only even Google knew how their algorithm worked. And that was an interesting comment to start looking into. Well, who knows what is actually being collected? Which group in an organization, like a service provider? Because there are silos in organizations, people responsible for ensuring the billing of systems, uh, the billing systems, people for ensuring authentication, people for ensuring marketing and sales. Who knows what? And what is actually occurring is a very interesting question. And over time, if you see the rhetoric of big providers, they come out with statements which are quite blurry. Oh, we need to clarify what we do. We don't take the location history, we take the last location point. Or 
we need to revise what we do because in fact, yes, if you're using the old API, you would be gaining access to all the location history versus just the last point. And oh yes, if we tell you on our app that you've switched off location tracking, we don't necessarily mean that we're not tracking you, you've just switched it off. And it's only when organizations are caught out and shamed do we see a response. It is only when organizations are fined that we see a response. Some of the early location privacy breaches by companies like Google and Microsoft and others were only fined a very small amount into the thousands. In fact, in 2009, I read an article for the Journal of Location-Based Services and thought it was quite farcical when I did the conversion from South, Koreans, South Korea's currency to the American dollar, they would just find, you know, a couple of thousand American, US American dollars. You know, that's not going to hurt a multi-billion dollar company. But we're seeing much heavier fines being delivered today into the billions. Interestingly, they're not making the news as much as I thought they would be, but increasingly now with the GDPR in the EU, we will see heftier fines and people beginning to listen. In 2005, we created this very high-level architecture looking at something we termed hierarchical positioning systems, which looked at how does location determination work. And we were considering uh, from a level of um, the global theater through GPS. So if someone was outside, could a GPS a satellite, a global positioning system, locate someone if they had uh, an app enabled and a sensor in their, their smartphone? Right through to uh, if we were searching using a cellular network, for example, like a 3G network, a UMTS network, right down to whether they were in building using a wireless LAN or some other uh, IP-based infrastructure, right through to the smartphone device or even potentially an embedded chip. And while that may have seemed very far-fetched uh, 13 years ago, uh, we are seeing people experiment today with implantables. They are not global positioning-based embedded systems, but they are uh, able to interact with smartphones, for instance, that are NFC or RFID, radio frequency identification readable. And the whole point was to denote whether someone was outdoors, right through to indoors, and whether you wanted to do a precise location fix, because the question we had was whether smartphones uh, being transferable would not be enough for law enforcement in the future. And we do already see uh, individuals, for example, convicted pedophiles, who are tagged with 3M anklet devices that do locate them, uh, and people are under house arrest. So every phone has a unique identity module. Uh, it's, our SIM card can be taken out of a smartphone and placed in another device, like a tablet or another smartphone. And the IMSI, the International Mobile Subscriber Identity, is the individual unique number uh, of, a, of a, a handset identifier. Um, and this may be referred to as an I IMI, uh, uh, International Mobile Equipment Identity. Uh, Apple, for instance, even has a specific unique device identifier that they use to track their users. And there is a file uh, that a user can actually access on their iPhone, which does determine where they have traversed uh, given a location breadcrumb. And of course, when companies collect this data, law enforcement agencies are likely to ask for it. And some of the approaches in the big data world have been about pre-processing. If you don't require the data, don't collect it. Therefore, it is not available uh, for viewing by others. But we seem to be embedding more and more sensors into everything around us, including our smartphones, which have an average of 14 different sensors, if I was to name them all. Everything from magnetometers to temperature sensors to altimeters, to determine whether someone is running, someone is stopping, uh, someone is out of breath, um, and pretty much uh, which direction they're traveling in, how fast they're traveling, so speed, distance, time estimates. So 
Because of public safety and the benefits this ability to locate someone gives us, we now have a requirement in most developed nations, and in particular in the US, that someone can be located if they have a smartphone and they've called 911 or 000 in Australia to about 7.8 metres with a 95% confidence level. So roughly on average, we can say that someone can be located down to about 10 metres at any point in time if they're using their smartphone. And that estimate can be off due to weather like today, clutter if we're in an in-building area, uh, highly uh, dense and tall skyscrapers uh, and other places that have moisture that can affect the confidence uh, that you'll get down to eight metres. And while we don't realise this, the value chain to actually offer a service but you are also interacting with content providers, application providers, handset providers, service providers, and all of these people come together to offer you a response to your request, you know, where am I? And I want to go to this place, and I not want to. And surveillance used to be visual. You used to have to track someone in a public space and follow them, you know, those old Dick Tracy shows uh, and comics. But things are now digital, and we've moved just from microphones being placed and planted like bugs uh, to surveil towards uh, more the transmission of images and videos uh, via remote locations. So many Pokemon Go users wouldn't realize, but when they've consented to the terms and conditions to play the game, actually you are granting the company Pokemon Go access to your uh, camera and your video capability. So is the photo you're taking in the augmented space also shared? Are the coordinates of the photo you're taking in the augmented space shared? Uh, is it shared with Pokemon Go's uh, company owner or is it shared with a subsidiary affiliates? Is it shared with McDonald's partnering with Pokemon Go? Where's it going to? And gamers are beginning to ask these questions on Reddit and on different blogs. You know, how safe is my information? What do they actually see? What is actually being given away? And we can capture an individual's location at a point of time. We can do real-time monitoring of a succession of locations. We can do predictive tracking. We can do retrospective tracking. These are all different capabilities that we can actually uh, apply to location information. And so the term my husband uh, coined, ubervalence, um, is really about the who you are through the uh, SIM card that you're carrying, the subscriber identity module, to where you are, the location sensor denotes where you are. And because we have jam-packed the smartphones with other sensors, we also know what condition you're in. We probably even know whether you have sweaty palms, whether your heart rate is high or low, and for any of you doubting this, just if you have an Android device, go to your Samsung Health app and have a good look at some of the incredible capabilities that we have now in our phones. And so human activity monitoring is the capacity and the capability that we've created through these very smart devices. We also have borrowed from the law enforcement work on situational awareness, because what we're finding is the tracking very much and the monitoring gives us an ability to know the state of someone and how that state is changing over time. So it provides context, which is often missing when we just get location coordinates and nothing else, without a message, for instance. We can argue that ubervalence actually um, gives us a great, greater amount of time. It's a, a over and above surveillance. It's an exaggerated surveillance. It's not just your normal, let me see what this person is doing. And we have run studies with very chunky Magellan GPS devices uh, on individuals back in 2005 and seen how much humans are creatures of habit. So if you can denote someone's uh, behavior over a seven-day period, most likely you'll be able to denote it over a month and a year. People are creatures of habit. And we've contrasted the quantitative data that you see here with daily diary entries. And then you can uh, map these entries and come out with a location breadcrumb. This is before the introduction of smartphones. 
And today you can do very sophisticated things with better resolution imagery coming from the satellites with um, pinpoint accuracy, I would say, and with a plethora of information, uh, more than we've ever had before. And so we look at technologies like Google Earth, which give us the ability to uh, apply uh, a data set on top, track someone's route right to the front door. And I haven't uh, included the originating point here. This is one of many samples that we had when we ran a four-week study of our students wearing uh, different devices that denoted their GPS with ethics approval. You could do this. I've done many an experiment like this. These are some of the trackers. You can even put them in vehicles. And this becomes a sticky point when we look at the US legislation, particularly the Fourth Amendment. In some cases, it has been considered physically intrusive to enter a car to place a, a tracking device into the car. In other court cases, in the lower courts, it has been said it is okay to do that. And so what we have at the moment are many cases dating back to when these technologies proliferated, which give us different rulings. And this is the kind of level of detail of information you can get from smartphones, from GPS tracking devices. You can see a longitude and latitude, an altitude, temperature. This device only cost us $50. And you could actually place it in a, in a vehicle and um, overtly gather uh, data for 30 days. Um, and then after 30 days, the memory would um, uh, be an issue. Um, so the ubervalence is really uh, the ability to get into someone's head by their physical behaviors and traits. We used to say through George Orwell's uh, 1984 that, you know, this was the sacred space. No one could trespass it. At least that's what we were told. Uh, but when we have rhetoric now from major players who are saying we want to be the third half of your brain, they actually mean it. And uh, if I know where you've been, I know who you are, I know what condition you're in, I probably know what you're thinking. The difficulty with ubervalence is that if we roll this out as a mechanism for identifying terrorists, for identifying uh, people at risk of taking their life, for identifying uh, children who are being abused, we run the risk of placing our faith in technology which is not always correct. We can manipulate information, we can misrepresent it, it can be wrong. And so while we're striving for this eye in the sky that can see all things, that is omniscient, at best I could guarantee you we have omnipresence, at best, but the all-knowing, all-seeing, which we're striving for and believe we're going to create, is actually not possible. Because even in someone who suicides, you will never know the reason why, but also you can't preemptively know whether they have regretted their action at the point of taking their life. That is only something for the personal individual to know. So someone may be planning an attack, of course, uh, they can be um, charged on a plan, but the final execution has not occurred. And what I don't want to get into is a life of minority report. I'm going to skip ahead. By the way, this is what a warrant looks like. Two page, very simple. An application by a federal law enforcement officer or an attorney for the government shows there is a reason uh, to believe that a person, property or object described above has been involved and likely will continue to be involved in the criminal activity identified in the application, et cetera, et cetera. You identify the date and time of tracking the device that has been installed for how long you want the individual or the item to be uh, uh, covertly placed to track the individual and, and so forth. And that is either a given or not given. I'm, I'm going to skip the very detailed um, case law that I've prepared and I'll make these slides available to everyone. We can also talk about it in a moment, um, but pretty much we're talking about search and seizure here, the Fourth Amendment.
So I'll skip through and get to some of the controversies with the sticking points of those cases that I flashed up. And a lot of the cases have argued, these are the main points, where the rulings have come out. Was the surveillance on a public road? Okay? Was the surveillance in a driveway? Was the surveillance in a garage? Interestingly, one of the court cases identified that retrospectively, after having tailed someone with a covert device in their vehicle, they would have had to throw the data out unless they removed the coordinates while the individual's car was parked in the garage because it was trespassing inside the home. And the Fourth Amendment protects property, the home, from trespass. So on that technicality, they manipulated the data to make it admissible in a court of law by removing the coordinates that indicated the man had the vehicle stationed in his garage. Was there probable cause? Had the warrant expired or was it active in a given area when data was collected? In the United States versus Jones case, the warrant had expired by a day. It was actually granted in Washington, D.C. And intrusively, the device was placed in the vehicle in a place called Maryland, as we all know. Is it one and the same? Is it the same district? So on two counts, one on a very minor geographic technicality of description in the actual warrant, and the second uh, being that the warrant had expired by a day, Jones was able to kick out the evidence from convicting him. However, they found another way to do so. Was the tracking for a reasonable period of time? Some of the anti-terrorist laws across the world actually allow governments to track someone post an arrest for up to 140, 200 days. It's, it's quite a lengthy time. Here, when we're talking about warrants, usually the process is a short time between seven and 28 days. So if you've only said you're going to track someone for seven days, going beyond that actually uh, nullifies the data collection. Was the tracking with an unsophisticated device? And what is an unsophisticated device? And if it was, yep, you don't need a warrant, right? Some of these court cases actually identified that. You don't need a wor warrant if the device is not accurate, because maybe it is and maybe it isn't. And what really constitutes accuracy, really, when we're talking about location-based services, is tracking a spouse's car illegal? No, not according to one judge. Is tracking an employee legal if they are suspected of internal misconduct? It's legal. Yeah, no, one, no one's going to dispute it, according to one judge. Right? And you'll see that if you read the notes of the case law, you are, we'll see that. Jumping ahead and just before we break for discussion, if you allow me another maybe five minutes, what about industry? So government agencies, law enforcement agencies have to go through all this process to gain access to a vehicle, for instance, or data collected on a smartphone. But what about industry? I alluded before that industry collects a lot of data. I can tell you government agencies are very jealous. And one of the ways they're circumventing the need to keep knocking on Google's door, on Microsoft's door, is by saying, you know what, we'll find our own way of very intrusive data collection. We'll start to collect data from lampposts. We'll start to collect data from smart vehicles. We'll, we'll start to collect data from smart meters, smart homes. We'll start to infiltrate in other ways that don't make us rely on industry for evidence. And this is a new wave that is occurring simultaneously with breakthroughs in Internet of Things technologies, but also government's ability to now harness the power of AI to supposedly conduct accurate facial recognition hits and matches. So imagine we are all outside going about our business in Washington and we are being photographed as we go around um, our day. And our behaviours look abnormal to the AI, the artificial intelligence uh, algorithm. And we're tapped on a, the shoulder by the local police and we're logged on to Palantir automatically. This data collection hasn't required your consent. You haven't signed any terms and conditions. The government 
and law enforcement agencies no longer wish to have to rely on industry for their data. But look what industry is doing regardless, which will just increase the plethora of information uh, that we can access. Google Latitude, location history breadcrumbs. Some of you don't realize if you have Android devices, you haven't turned off your location history. Does Google keep your location history? Back in 2011, they denied that they kept breadcrumbs. And then they changed their story and said, we only keep the last location, your last waypoint. Because these breadcrumbs are taken every 10 to 30 seconds, dependent on the setup. So it was only your last location, not really your history. But they had to come out and admit that. iPhone keeps record of everywhere you go. Privacy fees raised as researchers reveal file on iPhone that stores location coordinates and timestamps of owners' movements. Did you know that? And that's a visualization of one of the examples these researchers identified of one iPhone and the location breadcrumbing history uh, of the user. The popular times. How do you think Google generates that on Google Maps? Interestingly, on a Sunday morning, when I first arrived in Arizona, I used Google Maps, which I always do, uh, to do what I do on Sunday mornings. Now, in this building, there was, sorry, in this location, there were about seven different businesses. The following week, when I searched again, because I was in a different place to start walking, it pinpointed me directly to one of the seven businesses on that location. Fascinating. How did it know I was going to go there? That is the level we're talking about. And while Google states that it is anonymous data collection that is driving congestion and popular times information, where you can anonymize, you can also <laughs> do the opposite. So if you want to read later about uh, visit durations, wait times, popular times, you can do so in your own time. But now we have Street View cars, and of course these were sniffing iMac details, uh, Mac addresses, forgive me, as as the Street View vehicle was going through in 2013, again, Google was slapped on the back of the hand for sniffing out MAC addresses, right, which were open and not protected securely. How many people out there actually even know what a MAC address is? But this information, email addresses, and other personal identifiable data was being collected. Oops, the car did it. Really? And we think about the implications for smart cars and uh, driverless vehicles into the future. Verizon was ordered by the FBI to give over millions of records of information. They did so for a period of three months. There was no uproar on the street. The data was just handed over. Billboards that see you. This is now the beginning of the, the collection of behavior, gayet, other physical trait data as we move around, what if every billboard was smart? What if every billboard was a CCTV camera? What if every billboard uh, got more than just you know, your potential uh, marketing habits or buying behaviors? Here's one uh, gamer. Do we have control over map location privacy when adding friends? I can't find any info about safety. How Niantic is profiting off tracking where you go while playing Pokemon Go. This is called foot driving, ladies and gentlemen. Street view is like the car driving, right? Going through and getting household level data. Foot driving is when you, you smartly identify a mechanism for data collection by the users that give, give you your system. We beckon the ability to surveil our surrounds and give it over freely. We're actually becoming drones and data collection machines as humans. It's drones humanus. It's us becoming the data collectors. Forget the bots becoming the data collectors. Humans have become sensors in this push for more information. Let's see how we can manipulate a crowd to go to place A and B. Let's see how many people we can get to do that. Let's identify who would go. What are the demographic details? Are they male or female? Do they come from low socioeconomic groups? Who are they interacting with? Oh, thank you. I'm Niantic. I take your data and I do what I want with it. Did you know I used it? Oh, I didn't have to tell you. 
Pokemon Go is fun. It's entertainment, right, for the masses. But governments want this capability. Law enforcement agencies would love this capability. And that's why we have 50,000 Axon devices now distributed to offices across the US, wearable technologies that are also visually recording citizens daily. We recently discovered that the Pokemon Go account creation process on iOS erroneously requests full access permission for the user's Google account. Google has verified that no other information has been received or accessed by Pokemon Go or Niantic. Google will soon reduce Pokemon Go's permission to only the basic profile data that Pokemon Go needs, and users do not need to take any action themselves. And yet, has anyone ever read that terms and conditions? No, we just want the game. The secret history of the FBI's battle against Apple reveals the, the Bureau's mistakes. Google records your location even when you tell it not to. A recent story, August this year. Your phone knows where you've been and the government wants to know too. Google clarifies, clarifies how it tracks you even if location history is turned off. Why aren't we angry? If you're using an Android phone, Google may be tracking every move you make. And these are all different stories. You can see the dates. They all pertain to different breaches in people's privacy. Every single one of these was a different case dating back to 2007 with Google Latitude starting in 2009. We even have people in shopping malls tracking your movements in shopping malls. Path Intelligence began this in 2007 in the UK. You don't realize, but there's a little card, a little card that tells you that this tracking is occurring when you enter a shopping mall, like, like you can see. We can't even see the CCTV cameras anymore because they're embedded in the infrastructure, right? in the lighting systems. Little plaques on pylons telling you we are tracking you anonymously. And sometimes we might be able to track you a bit further than the shopping mall as well. We know, and we need this information so we can tell the people who are leasing the, the, the buildings and the, and the space how much they should be paying for the leasing space. This is rampant, this system. Most shopping malls today that are big are doing this. But recently there was a a comeback. In ruling on cell phone location data, Supreme Court makes statement on digital privacy. Five to four, the Supreme Court voted in favor of warrants for location tracking. Google at risk of a three billion fine over location tracking. Three billion. Now we're talking. Now the companies may respond and may listen up to stop tracking us without our consent. Google responds to location stalking outcry by tweaking words on its BS support page. To catch a robber, the FBI attempted an unprecedented grab for location data from Google. You see what's going on is a tug of war. But the citizen doesn't really prominently present in this case, right? What's happened to the citizen voice? So on that note, uh, I don't think we have to look at China. We can, should just look at Australia and the US. <laughs> China's going all guns blazing with regards to the capabilities. But I think actually we've got to look at what's going on here in the States, in Australia, in Canada even, that, that is a country that does respect privacy and is trying good things. The UK and uh, New Zealand even, you know, the five eyes uh, sharing. So I hope you've left more with uh, an impression uh, more than anything else, um, on what we need to do to address these problems, which are very complex. Thank you. Stunned. But not for a while. <laughs> you want to work? Manage your own Questions, comments, and I'll come around with the mic. We are fine, Mike. Yes, at the back.
You want to comment? <laughs> Anything you want. Hi, Mark Brodsky here. Uh, do you want to comment on who was watching you and why you got that Salesforce ad up there? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, yes, who's watching you? Uh, this was an article uh, by Robert Ellis Smith. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's the late Robert Ellis Smith now. Uh, in 2007. And... Uh, The reason why I put it up is because it was the first time the term was recognized. Um, so when we look at advertising on web pages, um, recommendations, uh, we often believe in our hearts. And if we have a second to reflect or two, we say, you know, someone's been reading my Gmail account. It's not someone, it's something has been trawling through. And this is becoming very sophisticated now because we even have responses to uh, emails that are ready for you to just press the go, you know. And amazingly, they sound like you even. They're not exactly like you. And I don't know how many of you in the audience press them. I don't press them for, for, for a reason. It would be great to do that. But I think my friends know me enough that I usually don't give a three-word re response. It, it would be letting them down if I, if I just press the button. It's another button. It's another automation feature, it's another go, it's another, I don't have time because another instant message is going to come on. But the relationships between maybe Forbes and advertisers, or not even Forbes, Google and advertisers and AdWords, and the ability to promote pages uh, that are more relevant to what you want to view, um, we've often termed the filter bubble. So I give you more of what you want, or I target you in a way uh, that I know would work based on previous behaviors. But we're getting very good at doing that and uh, psychologically profiling individuals. And as we've seen in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, that is now down pat uh, using different psychographics. So that's just a general response, but can you tell me what you were thinking of when you saw that? Well, you have an ad up there. I was just wondering how, how, how that particular ad got to you. Um, could have been back then. Uh, I don't know when I screenshotted it, but um, here's a little story. So uh, cloud computing, probably at around about this time, uh, Telstra in Australia was wishing to create a cloud computing platform. At the meeting I attended with Gilbert and Tobin, a law firm, at the Telstra office, uh, the head office in Australia, salesforce.com was also there. Could have been that. We're very upfront about our surveillance here. <laughs> <laughs> You're being watched. Mm -hmm. Appreciative. Pat. What do you picture the prescription and the public awareness of the issues that you just laid out? And the reason I ask is not to steal any thunder from my talk later, while well, you look at technology and I'm inferring possibly policy prescriptions as a solution here. Uh, Eric and I are some of the evil people creating this technology, and I say that we're among the leaders in the country and everything you're talking about. And we typically build this because there's a large market of people who want this, and mm -hmm. I don't majority <coughs> call them sheeple, but other people I know do. And if the people around you want the services, and we need to deliver and capture and transmit this data to service providers to provide you that service, so we all get paid and the customers are happy, the, the people have a culpability here as well. By the way, I'm not defending the big evil corporations. I'm just saying that's a calculus. So how would you respond? Well, firstly, I love your honesty, Pat, and uh, your colleague, because that's what I think uh, CISPO is, is very renowned for here, this openness and this sharing. Um, and my response will be equally open. Um, and I love this about our workshops. Every year we run them and we have this kind of openness, right? So we will never find a solution if we don't talk openly. So the first thing I would ask, uh, or let's reflect for a second. Is it an, let's, let's go really personal for a moment. Someone has kidnapped my child. 
and I want my kid back, right? Am I going to say, hang on a second, don't use the data that we have available because uh, it's unethical to do that because all I want is my kid and all I want is the perpetrator to be caught. And if I have a breadcrumb of the car, if I have a breadcrumb of the Apple iPhone, if I have a location fix at downtown DC at the corner of, you know, I Street and, and whatever else, give it to me. Give it to law enforcement, okay? Probable cause actually works at that time. What I'm hoping we don't get into is playing the at-risk game where a whole society of people you know, there are a few really bad eggs among us. Like anyone is really good, right? There are a few bad eggs. And we should weed those bad eggs out because, you know, if we can stop them right at the beginning of their criminal intent, that means they won't commit another crime and another offence and then, you know, we don't have to put them in jail and then their costs can be saved. And, and isn't that a great idea if we can develop Palantir software to start micro-targeting and micro-analyzing um, and give me, give me your telephone records, give me every telephone record and I want every search that you've ever conducted on your Google search engine and I want every transaction you've ever done in the credit history and I know I could find it down the road if I wanted to by the way and I want every interaction you've ever had on social media and I want every picture you've ever taken because I can take the coordinates of the images and the video, and I can do something really, really amazing with them. I can train data. I can train data based on your profile. And your profile mm, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't add up. You know, your education back in elementary school, you flunked a lot. I don't know. Indicators tell me kids who don't pass their get messed up with online communities, they're offenders. What I don't want is to stereotype society at risk, to eradicate the bad elements because that's the best way to do it. It's quantitative and based on people's behavior. The just-in-time mentality may work for supply chains. I don't think it works for human beings. But I don't want a society that's chaotic. And somewhere we've got to find the balance, which is not ubervalence. I don't want us to have a society in maybe 30 years time where people go, you know what, we're not going to have any more breaches in security because everyone's got chip implants. And you know, when I used to put the smartphone in my husband's boot and work thought I was actually going to work but I was staying home, you know, that'll, that'll, that'll go away in, you know, in the future because we're all going to have implants, we're all going to have security devices, we're all going to have the ability to transact with our banks and credits. We can shake hands and, and give information to one another that way. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't fall into a pit that says everything that's on, internet enabled, becomes a watching device because that will change people's physical behavior. That will create a stream of psychological impact that we've never seen before. That's going to create very nervous people. And I'm concerned that we've over, overstepped the mark. And in terms of citizens' awareness, it's growing rapidly. Rapidly. Cambridge Analytica was the first of many. You know, whoever thought maybe Facebook won't exist? Google's stability, is it really stable? How many more of these breaches can we sustain before we lose trust in organizations? So I think, I think as the awareness is growing, the penalties are rising, and the response has to be commensurate to that cry that's, that's starting to take, to, take gather, to take force. And it's no longer going to be a battle between government and industry. Citizens are going to say, that's my data. I want to blockchain it. I want it to reside somewhere, but I want to be able to consent to when I give it away. Whether you call that a consumer data right or whatever you call it, it's going to be there. It has to be there. Can you reply to that? Because I want to know your opinion. Well, I agree with the endpoint. Um, my my doctoral work was in electronic privacy, and I walked away from it because it seemed that I was fighting a tide. Uh, because I wanted what you want, so I agree with where you want to go. I'm stuck on the uh, 
uh, gory interactions, is that your word, of how we get there. Um, but I agree with where you want us to get there. Um, it's a complicated picture. Yes, and, and here to say that most of the intrinsic controls we've tried to create through industry guidelines, I studied them for seven years in Australia, nobody ever adheres to them, they're just guidelines. And other kinds of legal controls that we've put forward in the states, like the Location Privacy Protection Bill back in 2011, and the separate two senators, the GPS bill, which was there to protect privacy, never went up. So legal controls are not working. Soft regulation standards might work. Enforceable things might work. Technical implementations in devices might work. Encryption will work. But not when government is asking us to bust open the encryption and share it with them just in case. So we, we, we can get there. I agree with you. I'm, up, I'm, I'm optimistic about it. But I'm not optimistic about the picture I've painted today. We're really in trouble. Amy. I'm trying to formulate this as a question. I, I'm curious about a sort of a more nuanced side effect of what you're describing, which is the accidental or possibly useful creation of norms of behavior, both individually and sort of in the aggregate. So I start to have information about how sweaty everyone's palms are. And then I get anxious because my palms fall outside of the range of that norm and everything that you're describing sort of produces more and more of that aggregate sort of individual knowledge about more and more of like my my movements, um, even my own daily habits. So I have anxieties about um, the kind of delights of anomalous behavior <laughs> um, and our recognizing that we can choose it, that we could choose a book that Amazon didn't recommend or that we can go someplace in a different direction. And uh, so I just wonder whether there is a place to to name this, if, if it's a real thing, um, and, and how we learn about that, because it is not a danger or a safeguard in the same way that you've been talking about it, but it, for me, permeated your, your talk. So that's a great question, and I'll respond to that with a little story. Um, I'm an ambassador for a company in Australia called Bugbean, and Bugbean created a software called Antisocial, there to help young people uh, with perceived addiction uh, to minimize or control and regulate their behavior. Initially, when uh, I signed up for this, I made the organization create a four-page privacy statement. Because what I anticipated is if this app took off, we would know how often you unlocked your phone. We would know how often you downloaded an app. We would know how often uh, you used Facebook and for how long. Amazingly, the product uh, debuted and had like 11,000 downloads in the first month. It then skyrocketed and became the number one download in the UK. It wasn't up at the top of the charts for a long time, but now there's hundreds of thousands of people on this application. And I'm cognizant that I'm one of the participants that is giving over my data. When I knocked on the door of the chief executive, a wonderful man who was motivated to create the program to help a neighbor whose son had been heavily addicted at 15, honorable reasons, he created a privacy contract with me. Yes, we will never abuse this data. We will never sell this data. We will never hand it over. It is now going to be possibly used by law enforcement or military personnel for defense, not to track, to identify at risk soldiers of suicide, to identify at risk children. Is that bad or is that good? And interestingly now to go to your exceptional comment on profiling, and what if I'm an outlier? What does it say? Do I bury my head and go away and cry that I'm not normal? And when I ran one of my studies in my classes of 45 students, you know, the students were gloating. I've got 10,000 waypoints. I said, you had a busy weekend. Yep, I went windsurfing. I went here. I ran on the beach five kilometers. And one of my best students comes to me and says, I'm going to fail this assignment. And I said, why? He said, I only have 400 waypoints. 
And I said, that means you actually worked. And he said, no, but everyone else is doing great things and they're having fun. And I honestly felt like crying because he had determined his level of sociability based on the number of waypoints. And many of us determine our health by the number of Fitbit steps we've, we've walked that day. This is not correct. We can't quantify ourselves like this. The outliers we know are heavily addicted use their smartphone for something like 12 hours straight. You can see them in the reports. 12 hours straight. Now, can we be sure it was the same person? No, because mobile phones can be transferred. For example, I could give my mobile phone to my son and then to my daughter and then so on, a friend. But when the outliers are showing 12 hours as opposed to two and a half hours on average, to three and a half hours. And by the way, these are people who recognize, you know, most of the people who are suffering with internet addiction or internet gaming addiction don't recognize they're addicted. The first thing they'll say is, I'm not addicted. So the people who have downloaded our app are the people who recognize behavioral patterns in themselves. So I think outliers and exceptions is what you're talking about. They tell us a lot. My worry is that we'll use those outliers to say, you know what, that person probably is mentally ill. They stay home between 9 and 7, they, or they sleep all day, they don't move. Or other patterns, that kid's autistic. Other patterns are, you know, someone who's impulsive, keep moving. Maybe they've suffered a significant grief, grief and death in their family and they just need to keep moving and moving. I've met some of these people. So we're going to start making inferences. My problem is these inferences will not always be right. And it's none of our business whether they are right or not right because we will lose our freedom if we allow technology to dictate because if we get up in the morning, Alexa, this, where should I go? What should I do? What's the fastest animal on earth? What's it going to be outside? How about we go outside and feel the snow and go it's snowing? You know? I actually hate to interrupt this because it is, it is profoundly important. Um, we have schedules to keep. Yes, we must move on, sadly. Um, uh, it's uh, ten, 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 almost 10, 10. So, so just, a, a, uh, just a couple final, final points. Um, uh, you, you made clear that one of the, the um, ways we're going to have to intervene here is through the regulatory state and legal frameworks and constitutions and so on. Um, some, something you didn't mention, but I know that you also think is important, that's central to the sorts of things we've talked about here over the years is, is thinking about innovation processes in different ways too, and thinking about um, how, how you build in at the early stages of innovation processes a capacity for reflection um, that keeps us from continually getting blindsided by the stuff that we do um, when we wake up and say, oh my God, what happened? Um, I should also say, not that you need to hear this, but, but the, 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 uh, um, the potential for a kind of conformity uh, that comes through this is, is extraordinarily frightening for somebody who I know I would have been drugged into compliance as a second grader with uh, and diagnosed as ADHD um, uh, if I had been born 30 years later. Um, and now, Lord knows what they would do to my brain. So, um, uh, so I think this, this is something that is, is incredible. When we, we know that societies uh, are entirely dependent for their creativity um, on, uh, on the fringes. Um, things like unions and, and uh, uh, un unemployment insurance uh, were considered to be completely deviant ideas in the 1890s. Um, well, now we can take care of those ideas, right, by identifying anyone who would think of them and make sure that they don't have a chance to be hurt. So, so, uh, so citizenry and responsible innovation and legal frameworks are what we have. Uh, the question is how to mobilize them. Um, so thanks for, for doing that. Uh, and thank you all for participating in the conversation. And I apologize for the um, soapbox at the end, but I couldn't help myself. Um, so um, we have another event tomorrow. Actually, the, the speaker at that event, Bob Cook Deegan, talking about Alzheimer's research um, and uh, where we might need to be headed to make some progress there if you can wade through what will be nice weather tomorrow. Hopefully you can to join us again. Otherwise, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Katina, for an incredibly 
um, I'm not going to say provocative because it, it is it is a you're putting our noses in where we are and what we have to look at. So, um, so thank you all. Let the conversation continue. Feel free to hang around and uh, see you all soon. And you're all uh, welcome to stay for the whole day's proceedings. Now we're going to have a, a break and speed networking, please, as we grab some goodies at the back. And I think we have our first talk at 10:30 by Pat Scannell. Thank you.